You've got ideas, you've got ambition, you've got no time, or so you think. I'm Marissa Lonick, and I help busy moms with big dreams and no time. Join me each week as I dive into time management strategies, goal setting and achieving framework, and inspiring guests who are juggling mom life, work life, fill in the blank life. Dreams don't work unless you do, and just because you're a mom doesn't mean you can't still make it happen, whatever it means to you. Welcome to the Mama Work It podcast. Hello, hello, mama friends. Welcome back to another amazing episode of the Mama Work It podcast. So excited you're here. In case you're new around here and you're not familiar, my name is Marissa Lonick, and I am your host and the founder of Mama Work It, where we support women in the juggle of mom life and work life and wife life and fill in the blank life. So I am so pumped today to have Leslie Ford on the show. I heard Leslie speak years ago and I just knew that she got it. She really understood the working mom. I felt quite frankly, Leslie was like in my brain during that season, and I am just so excited for her to share more of her wisdom, her insight, her knowledge with us today on the show. So if you haven't met Leslie before, she is the CEO and founder of Mom's Hierarchy of Needs, which provides evidence-based tools for moms to reclaim time from the never done list, their to-do list, uh, for their well-being. With over 3,500 parents having participated since March of 2020 in the Mom's Hierarchy of Needs research study, it is the longest running of its kind about the pandemic's ongoing impact to work and life, care, wellness needs for parents. Leslie comes from 20 years of research and has held leadership positions at Houghton Mifflin, Harcourt, Care.com, and C-Space. She now focuses her research on childcare, elder care, mental health, and education sectors. Leslie is a frequent speaker and consultant to organizations on how to retain and support parents, caregivers, and people of color, including HubSpot, Merck, Scholastic, and the Barr Foundation. Her writing about well-being, equity, and the future of work has appeared in the Washington Post, Slate, Parents Magazine, TLNT, Directorship, and her website, of course, Mom's Hierarchy of Needs, among other publications. Leslie, what a bio. I cannot wait to dive into this conversation. Thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. I've been looking forward to this conversation, and thank you for the kind introduction. Oh, me too. I'm definitely looking forward to it. So I'd love to know, Leslie, if you could just tell us a little more about your journey, what led you to mom's hierarchy of needs and where you are today. Oh, absolutely. Well, I completely burned out after returning to work from my second maternity leave, which now is a little over, just over nine years ago. Um, At the time, I'd taken on a fairly large promotion. I went from managing one team to two teams while I was like seven months pregnant. And, you know, I was assured by my manager and our team at the time, oh, don't worry, we'll have your back, it'll be fine. But in the 12 weeks that I was out, it was like the whole world changed at my then company. We had gone public not that long before, and we kind of... I kind of came back to what felt like a new job and I was being asked to bring my most strategic, clear thinking self to the role when I was sleeping in 90 minute increments and I had a newborn and a toddler. And like a lot of us, I felt like I suddenly was facing all of these challenges at work. I had one area of my department, several people completely unplanned and unfortunate reasons who all had to go out on FMLA leave Um, So not parental leaves. It was just unplanned leaves. I had several open recs that had to be closed because the company had kind of focused more heavily on profitability. And so I was short staffed and exhausted. And I thought the answer must be to just work harder, which is what many of us are taught. So I'd be typing away, typing away, trying to like shield the glow of the computer from the co-sleeper 
one in the morning, two in the morning. There were a lot of days where I would drive out to the office, which was a good, you know, this is when we were all still physically going into work every day. And, you know, I would get there, race into the, like race through the parking garage, race up the stairs and realize I had left the breast pump at home and I would have to drive all the way back. There were also days that I had left a notebook at home that had important notes for a meeting I was about to conduct. So, and there were a lot of days I just didn't remember driving there at all. It became unsustainable. It was a job that I once loved, but I, I left it and I did what a lot of women do and I never thought I would do. And that was to downshift. So I went from managing these two departments. And even though I was a vice president in a public company, I just did not feel like I could raise my hand and say that I was struggling. So I took a job where I negotiated a four-day work week. I mean, I was still in a senior role, but I only had one direct report instead of a large group of people. And I took a 40% pay cut. And it took over two years to recover. And that's really what led me to just wondering if I was the only one. I thought other moms must have seen some memo I didn't see. I thought that I felt like I was going to die, but everyone else seemed to be doing okay. And because I'm a researcher by training, and that was how I began my career, I became really curious after I kind of came up with the idea for the mom's hierarchy of needs, which was just in a moment in a discussion with a with a founder uh, whose dad, who said, why are moms so stressed? I'm like, oh my goodness, how much time do you have? <laughs> like, let's pull up a chair. Exactly, like, <laughs> I'm like, you've got three kids, but let, let's talk about it, right? So that really was a moment of, oh, what, what would the mom's hierarchy of needs look like? How would it look for other moms? And the first time I just drew it on a little piece of paper, it was my epiphany moment where I realized that the reason I was struggling was because before having kids, I had always just conditioned myself to believe that anything I would do for my self care, which in my world is defined as things like sleep and nutrition and movement and healthy adult relationships and, you know, fun and learning things that are actually designed to support our health and well being, I would do those things when everything else was done. But once you have, and done meant done. But once you have kids, there's no done. There's no done at the end of the day. There's no done at the end of the rainbow. All the things that we really prioritize, which in the, in the base of the mom's hierarchy of needs are the things that we cherish and prioritize, like our kids' health and their well-being and their milestones, their education. The next layer includes our household responsibilities and all the things that are there. And then the next role, the next layer includes our professional role. So if you condition yourself to believe that things have to be done and you are really responsible for a lot of really large things that are never done, what happens is you put off yourself like every mom on the planet. You think, well, someday or when everything else is done, then I will. But what happens is that time doesn't come because there is no time anymore. We also feel guilty about what little time we do take because we're socialized to be in service all the time. So I became really obsessed with this problem, why it was so hard, why it was so hard for me, why it was so hard for other women. And then what were the structural and societal reasons, especially the systems of work that make it as challenging as it is? Yeah. So many truth bombs there, Leslie. I mean, I had like full body chills when you were talking about those stories, because I think as working moms, we've all, we all have our version of that story. Mm -hmm. And it is such a challenging season to be in for so many reasons. It's challenging because not every work environment has the resources and tools and empathy to support it. It's challenging because it feels vulnerable to share that you're struggling, especially when you are a high achieving woman in a leadership position. It feels challenging because you feel like you're failing at everything because like you said, the list never feels like it, it is done, whether that's the work project, whether that's 
spending enough quality time with your kids, whether that's taking care of yourself, like fill in the blank of what it is. It is such a challenging season. And I just so appreciate the work that you're doing. I think our missions are very much aligned, but I so appreciate even the visual that you've given women in this space, the actual hierarchy of needs. And guys, if you haven't visited Leslie's website, please do after this conversation because that visual is powerful. I'm curious if you, I know we can't paint that picture (laughs) visually speaking, but can you talk us through what it looks like? And you said you sketched it out, you know, initially and how that came up for you. Absolutely. Um, A lot like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which was kind of how the Mm -hmm. kind of concept came to mind. It looks like a triangle, a pyramid. And at the base in Maslow's world are all the things that are foundational that we consider really critical, like food and shelter and, you know, all those, you know, components that are really essential to life. But in mom life, the things that we consider foundational are our highest priorities, like our kids and their well-being and their health. And then the next layer that we really prioritize is everything that we kind of own in the household. And sadly, here we are in 2024 and mom's when partnered with dads are more likely to own everything associated with managing the household still, right? Regardless of her role, regardless of um, her partner's role, regardless of any of, of income distribution, any of that, right? We're more likely to own the household. And then you have professional life. And depending on the nature of your work, most roles have become amorphous, right? We're expected to be always on. And even though there's been a huge improvement with the ability to work remotely, with the ability to have hybrid work for certain types of jobs, what happens, what has happened as I've seen in my study and as I've heard from lots and lots of moms is that that pressure to feel like you have to demonstrate your working has just moved from being in the office and staying late to staying on your, on your zoom or staying on Microsoft teams or Slack or whatever version of your little green light has to be on, has to be on. So, you know, this dilemma of needing to do things in that bottom two thirds that are perpetual commitments, they have no finish line they're really time consuming and they're also really important and we feel like we're responsible for them and we generally are responsible for them. Having that means that if you want to take any time for sufficient sleep, for your nutrition, for your mental health, to go see that doctor, to schedule that mammogram, whatever it is, you have to carve out that time. Like no one's going to give it to you. It's not going to be left over at the end of the day. And even your loving family who all adore you, they will not help you make the time. Like you are going to have to claw that time. You are going to have to be ruthless about pursuing that time. And even then you're going to feel all the emotional tugs of guilt telling you that you should be busy or you should be in service to your family or you should be sending off one more email for your employer, or you should pick up five more Legos off the floor before you go to bed. All that baggage is floating up there and it makes it really difficult. But what I think every mom listening needs to know is we are at greater risk for stress-related everything. Autoimmune disorders, depression, anxiety, fatal heart disease. Like This isn't just a matter of happiness and fulfillment, although I hope everyone wants happiness and fulfillment, this is really about longevity and health. So if you go down, that's not good for you. It's not good for your kids. Certainly not good for your career. Like everybody loses. Yeah. I mean, think about the last time you were sick at home as a mom. Think about all the stuff that either didn't happen or didn't get done or just like, like, I want I'm not going to say the ship sinks, you know, because I, I have a partner, he's wonderful. And he definitely like, 
is supportive and, and does lots of things here. But moms are really running the show, as you said, in a lot of a lot of the households. And so if your health is not there and your health should be your top priority, in my opinion, first and foremost, because without your health, you can't help anyone else, right? Like the oxygen mask, all, all the things we've heard before. Um, but yeah, I, I love that. I love to really think about that because like if you had the flu or you had COVID or you were just really not well one day, you physically couldn't do any of those things and you see the effects it had. So now think about if that were a chronic condition or something really, really serious where you were in a hospital or it was, you know, God forbid fatal, like think about the repercussions of that on just life in general and how terrible that would be. Yeah. I mean, we are conditioned to persist and to keep going and we have so much compassion and energy and drive and those are all incredible gifts but at the same time the other side of that is like we're socialized to be neglectful of ourselves and we're socialized to be martyrs and we are socialized to persist through pain and that becomes self-defeating so understanding that about how society views mothers and understanding that about how we view ourselves is really important because as I'm sure many people have learned, and I've certainly learned that even when you get through the intensity of potty training and teething and diapers and all of the, the chaos of the lack of sleep that comes with that, then you're dealing with a hundred emails a week from the school and multiple teachers mm -hmm. and multiple specialists and scheduling multiple doctor's appointments and sports and birthday parties and the cognitive load, you know, also known as the mental load, which we all know so well, right? That just increases as the children become older and the cognitive demands at work increase as you become more senior. So it becomes like a collision and having that reservoir of health, having that reservoir of stamina, of energy that comes from your well-being is the fuel that allows you to navigate the complexity of it because it is complex. It's not as if anyone can just kind of sail through it without feeling some level of you know, strain. Um, so I, I just encourage everyone to really think critically about where can you grab a little wellness today, tomorrow, every day. It doesn't have to look perfect. It doesn't have to be what you used to do, but it has to be something. Yes, I agree. I like to tell people to do one nice thing for themselves daily. Mm. One nice yes. thing for yourself daily. It could take, it could take a lengthy amount of time or it could take 30 seconds, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm curious, you've been doing this research for a long time. Um, I have to ask, did anything ever surprise you during your review of the information that you were receiving from Mom's Hierarchy of Needs? Or what was a reoccurring theme maybe that you saw in the study? Oh, that's a great question. So there's a few things that come to mind. Certainly in my bigger study, which is the now post-pandemic study, it began March 30th of 2020, and it's still going. It's in wave nine and over, you know, close, it's like close to 3,700 parents, 98% of whom are women. So it's very mom-centric. But in that study, self-care is worse now than it was in spring of 2020. And although on the, you know, as you kind of hear that, you think, how could that be? But then when you think about it, you realize, oh, all of the activities have come back on the calendar. Birthday party circuits back, work travels back, all those things are back. But the infrastructure to support it has not improved. And all the things that we rely on, child care, elder care in some cases, the medical and healthcare system, they've all been so decimated in the past three and a half plus years that interacting with them takes twice as long, three times as long. Interacting with school systems, twice as long, three times as long. 
All of those industries that are very female centric are incredibly short staffed. So we are doing more. It is taking more time to do everything. And that's reflected in our self-care um, practices, which again, in my world, it's not spa days and manicures. It's really things that you would do to protect your mental, physical, and emotional health. The other mm -hmm. thing that was, again, maybe surprising, but not so surprising, I guess, for a lot of us is the fact that in the study, in the more recent wave of the study, moms say, less than 4% of moms say that they feel like they have the psychological safety to raise their hands and ask their managers or their leadership teams for what they really need from work. Less than 4%. Um, Another stat that was really interesting, and it varies a little bit month to month, but access to flexible expectations at work at many points in time in the past few years or in the past maybe year and a half since I've added this question um, are more important than a raise. Just having flexible expectations because we all see and know there's a certain amount of faux flexibility going on right now. Organizations are saying they're family friendly and they're flexible, but the reality is when you pull back the covers, what's underneath are everyone's being asked to deliver at the same rate, the same key performance indicators, but they have half the staff or half the budget or the market conditions have completely changed. And people are trying to race as fast as they can to maintain or grow in their careers in an uncertain economy while they're also doing, you know, five times as much at home. And it's unsustainable. Yeah, I agree with you. They're surprising, but they're not, you know, mm -hmm. because just taking a look at where we're at with, you know, Lots of organizations doing layoffs, so that stress factor and that increased workload if your team has shrunk, or just cost of living continuing to be on the rise and feeling that pressure if you're adding to your family or if you're raising kids. Man, you know, they always said to me before I had kids, kids are expensive. And I was like, yeah, yeah, kids are expensive. A hundred percent. Like they are expensive and part of what I think many of us feel pulled towards is that once you have them, you want to deliver opportunities, safety, enjoyment. You want to curate, Absolutely. right? You want to curate a set of experiences that allows them to meet their potential and doing that. Mm -hmm is very expensive. So right? it puts a real yeah. premium on being able to make yeah. work work. Yeah. I think we all want to do more for our kids, even than we had, even if we had the best childhoods ever, we want to, we want to top that, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it's not only a strain potentially financially for people, but it's a strain of time, energy, resources, you know, just, all the things, right? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some people call it self-care. <laughs> I think we've all seen the stuff coming through our social feeds and, you know, we hear it. I feel like I hear it almost like too much where I roll my eyes a little bit, um, even though I know how crucial and critical and important it is. And you actually call it preventative health. So I have my take on it, which I think it is a necessity, as I said, one nice thing for yourself. I think it, it's it's not necessarily what you think it is when you close your eyes and you think about the spa day or the mani-pedi. It could be a number of different things. Sometimes, Leslie, self-care for me is literally like decluttering my home because I feel so good when it's done, you know? So it, it can just fit so many different molds. But I'm curious, like, what's your take on self-care, preventative health, and especially for this working mom? Absolutely. Well, I think you described it really well. Like we all see this term out there everywhere, right? And the wellness industry has kind of taken the term self-care to mean everything from a spa day to a face mask to getting really good 
like skincare products, right? Um, yeah. And so it it's frustrating. And I think moms and women in general, right? We feel this tension that there's this multi-billion do- dollar industry tied to self-care and wellness, but a lot of us are not feeling so well. So it's It's frustrating and it makes you want to kind of reject the whole concept. But self-care, the term actually was coined by Audre Lorde, who was a like poet, activist, scholar, and writer. And she defined self-care as a radical act in a world that doesn't want us to have it. In effect, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but she looked at self-care as an act of resistance, caring for your own health whether you think of it as putting on your oxygen mask first, whether you think of, as I do, preventative health care, which top of the hierarchy, I later learned after I drew the hierarchy and after I came up with those categories at the top, I worked for two mental health care companies, did a lot of research, have spoken to tons of hundreds now of doctors and scientists and experts. And I learned that those things at the top are the things that reduce the stress hormone cortisol in our bodies and help us manage the intensity of parenting and work and help us manage all of the like physiological effects of being under stress. So when I learned that, I really started to look at self-care through this lens of, you know, this is kind of a critical aspect of our humanity, not only does it feel badly to live in self-sacrifice and perpetual service, it's also bad for us. And if we really are as concerned as we are, and we are, right, about our kids and um, our families and our careers, like, then it has to be a priority. If you care about your own longevity and health, whether it's to feel good or to persist in service to what you value, it's critical. So that has become my North Star because after I burned out, which is what led to this whole Mom's Hierarchy of Needs uh, series of research studies, after I burned out, I, I realized that I wasn't doing well. I needed to understand why. I needed to kind of have some sort of like, framework to react to and to build a new set of habits around because the way I took care of myself before kids looked really different. Um, You know, I worked a lot of hours. I was always someone who kind of tried to follow those rules for growth in the workplace, but I had these release valves, right. That I could kind of insert into my schedule with vacations or with outings or with reading books and sitting and reading a book for hours, right? All of those things that frankly are just not as accessible once you have children, you have to do it differently. So finding that process for you and like, it could be decluttering, right? Um, One mom that I interviewed a while back, uh, Dr. Leah Rupatter, she described it as just managing her energy is how she thinks of self-care. Um, others have described it as doing something that is fueling and fulfilling, like to your term and your mantra of making sure people do something nice for themselves every day, right? Finding what it, what it is for you that makes you feel good and is good for your health and good for your longevity. That's crucial and we can't ignore it. Yeah. So true. I like to think about it as whatever's going to make me feel whole again in that moment. And so Mm -hmm. this is not only like a seasonal change and shift, as you said, right? Like, in my opinion, I mean, I think, yes, it's much more accessible pre-kids to like decide to go on a trip and actually enjoy it, you know, Mm -hmm. and and not have all the other responsibilities potentially that that you would need to bring with you um, or reading for hours on end. But even just, um, not just the seasonal change, but even just the change of like day to day, like some days my self-care, I feel really good about the fact that like most days I'll say my morning routine includes a workout. That's part of my self-care. It's part of what really sets my mood, my energy, 
puts me in a great place for the day. And last night I set the intention that this morning, I normally wake up at 5.30. I said, tomorrow my self-care is going to be to sleep till six because I know I need the rest. Mm. I just know I need the rest. Um, so I think it can shift even day to day of how you look at that. Like, yes, some days I like to declutter. Some days I'm like, no, thanks. I'm going to Netflix this and that's going to be my form of self-care right now. That's what I need. 100%. So being really flexible with that too, like I would encourage listeners um, to just brainstorm a list of all the things that bring you some joy, bring you some peace and pull from that. And it can look really different, but pull from it in a consistent fashion on a daily basis. Absolutely. I think that's critical. Um, and to be compassionate with yourself when it doesn't work the way you expect it to, or you had this yeah. thing that you really wanted to do, or you thought would be really fueling. And then the school calls or someone throws up on you or, you know, a hundred things can happen <laughs> that, you know, completely alter your schedule. So yeah. knowing that and allowing that to be the reality, but still have this persistent belief that you deserve the time that you deserve the quality of care that you give to others. And frankly, as I tell all moms and people, like I, I was with a group of employees yesterday for a client and it was in person. I don't do many of those in person, but it was all employees. Um, they, even though I was invited by the employee resource group, but everybody kind of showed up and, you know, it's, it resonates with people to care for themselves. And, and I explain that, you know, if you burn out, it's not, a, it's not good for your career either. I mean, it's not. So whatever you're trying to do no. professionally is not positively correlated with overwork and burnout. And we're kind of conditioned to work that way, but it's harmful and it ends up becoming a self-defeating. So caring for your own well-being, even if it means you don't get to those next five emails today, or you don't finish that presentation tonight, you finish it tomorrow, or you know, whatever that looks like for you, giving yourself that space allows you to have more, like I, when I shared my story in the beginning, I was a zombie. I had been such a creative, energetic problem solver until I burned out. And then I was a zombie. So you know, give yourself the gift, especially if you're trying to grow professionally, of caring for yourself. And it will pay positive dividends in every area of your life. Such a good way to look at it. Yeah, the positive dividends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a marathon, not a sprint. True. So, Leslie, I know we could chat about this topic for hours and hours and hours. And I really want to, <laughs> but we keep our episodes to around 30 minutes. So what we're going to do now is we are going to move on to a few fun, random questions in our lightning round where our listeners can just get to know you a little bit better on a different level. Are you ready? ready. Okay. If you could only eat one food, Leslie, for the rest of your life, what mm. would it be? Calories don't count. I am like a serious chocoholic. Um, I, I think chocolate is a food guru. I even did a brief stint of a career change and went to culinary school and worked wow. in food for a little while because I love food so much, but there's something special about chocolate. Like I, I'd put a nice yeah. high quality dark chocolate on my list. Delicious. Yes. Can't argue with that. What if they made a movie about your life? Who would you want to play you? Oh, so this isn't, okay. So this is interesting. We, I worked in an organization where they had celebrity lookalikes um, and they, Ooh. and they put Naomi Campbell up on my cube. And I kind of liked that yes. pick. I thought, all right, you yes. know, some sort of like fly black supermodel type of person would be fantastic. But I was, I was very um, honored when, when she was chosen as my lookalike. I could see it. I could definitely see it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Oh, what if you could have any superpower? What would it be? Oh, I would love to be able to predict the future. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's 
a great answer. It saved me so many hassles and heartaches in my life. Um, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Love it. Finally, what is something most people don't know about you? Mm, that my parents are from Barbados. I grew up in both countries. And so That's that awesome. is my heritage. Love that. Well, Leslie, before we say goodbye, please tell our listeners where they can find you, where they can access Mom's Hierarchy of Needs, anything else you want to let us know. Absolutely. Um, please come visit momshierarchyofneeds.com. All the links to all the things are there. I have an incredible wellness app for moms. It's at timecheck.momshierarchyofneeds.com. It's a web app. You don't even have to download anything. It's free and it's like less than a minute a week to just take a temperature check on how much time you're spending on your self-care. Um, we also have a great membership for moms. That's a community where we involve ourselves in problem solving for each other once a month. And there's some great resources. And then if you are in an organization where you want your employer to provide you with more support, please take a look at the allies at work page. I go in to help companies look for those patterns of fatigue that, stifle and exhaust people and liberate the parents and caregivers so they have time to grow in their careers and have a life and have a family outside of that. Amazing. So many wonderful resources. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you so much for being here, Leslie, and just sharing all of this amazing content from your research study, your personal story that I know is so relatable to many of our listeners. It's so relatable to me and just taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us. Thank you. I'm grateful you invited me. This was a lot of fun and I knew it would be. You've been listening to the Mama Work It podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and would love if you could take a quick minute to leave me a review on whichever platform you're listening from, and maybe even send a note to a fellow mama friend recommending it. Reviews and recs help this podcast grow and reach more like-minded, awesome moms. And if you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click that button so we can stay in touch, girl. By the way, if you haven't checked out the Mama Work It website, please do. There are lots of free resources and great articles there that can help you with the juggle of work life, mom life, wife life, fill in the blank life. So head on over. Thanks again for being part of the tribe. I'll see you soon. But in the meantime, keep on working it, mama.